Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar uh, organized by Korean Association of International Studies, featuring Professor Alexander Wentz from the Ohio State University, which is happened to be my beloved alma mater. Oh. In fact, uh, about 20 years ago, I was spending some time at the Motion Center of Ohio State University, and I happened to encounter Professor Wentz over the smoking area. I don't know whether he has quit or not. I'm I have quit, yes. I have oh, quit. <laughs> that's very good for you. All right. In fact, this seminar was organized, I mean, intended to be a part of annual conference of this KAIS. He said postponed to this point. At the time, we had two people, uh, Professor uh, Daniel Judney of Johns Hopkins University, as well as Professor Alexander Wendt. But that part went well. Now we have another webinar featuring Professor Alexander Wentz with more time. In fact, I have studied international relations over four years, but still I'm struggling with in catching up what has been going on around the world at this very moment with uh, Brexit, uh, Trumpism, and that COVID-19, all those pandemics, the way how the world has uh, uh, um, addressed the problems and so on. So we are in the middle of chaos, I think. And uh, probably I'm intoxicated by the mainstream theories that with my own theories, I could not account for it. So I have been really looking forward to this meeting where Professor Wendt may illuminate or enlighten us uh, in, with a new way to look at the international relations, international politics, or the world itself. So I'm gonna have uh, invite Professor Wendt for uh, your own presentation you can use as much time as you can, uh, uh, you like. And uh, for the audiences who are connecting to this meeting, uh, I will invite you, if you have any question or comment, I will, after your presentation, I will invite Professor Jeon Jae-sung to make a sort of comment. Then I also I will invite the audiences to raise any questions, comments, either through directly or through chat windows. So with uh, having said that, uh, the microphone is yours, Alex. Well, thank you, Professor Kim, for that very generous introduction, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, my apologies for the delay. My technology skill, I've just learned how to do PowerPoint this year for the first time in my life, and I'm still actually mastering the technology of controlling my screen and the PowerPoint and your faces at the same time. Um, so we may have a few glitches along the way during the, the seminar tonight, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, also, I should point out that it's about 8.15 p.m. my time. I went to dinner. I had a glass of wine. So I'm a bit more relaxed than I usually am when I give a formal talk like this. I hope you'll forgive that. Maybe that's good. But um, And also my voice may give out at some point. So I'm warning you about that ahead of time as well. So lots of red flags to worry about, but hopefully we'll be fine. Um, so my talk tonight, um, Quantum Theory as Critical Theory is the, is the title, and it's based on a paper um, that I've spent the past couple of years writing and revising and revising. Um, and the paper actually was just rejected by the American Political Science Review, APSR. So um, I revised it, and now I sent it back out. Um, but that was disappointing. But the important thing is that um, whatever comments you guys have, on the paper or my presentation or whatever um, are things that I can include in the paper because I'll be doing at least another one round of thorough revisions anyway. So I can definitely use your comments. They won't just be ignored. I'll bring them in as much as I can. Um, so I'm looking forward to the discussion about the paper. Um, the paper is based, well, it's based, I guess, on my 2015 book, uh, Quantum Mind and Social Science. Um, but it's not really, the book is really only the first part of the paper. And the paper really tries to go beyond the book in an important way, in the sense that the paper is really about the stakes. What's at stake in thinking about quantum social science and this whole debate with classical thinking and so on. Um, and so if we can flip the, um, turn the slide. Let's see if we can, if Hyun Su can, there we go. Let's do the stakes. There we go. And now go to the first one. Next one. Scientific. Okay, here we go. So there are really two kinds of stakes that are at stake in this talk. Uh, the first 
are what I'll just call scientific stakes. And um, the, in, the, in this sense, quantum social science uh, may or may not lead to better predictions, better explanations, better understandings of human behavior than classical alternatives. So just straight ahead social science, which one is better at dealing with human behavior, classical or quantum, okay? So, and that's one debate that is being had in this larger context. Um, the scientific stakes are important, obviously, um, but they're not the stakes that I'm interested in today. So let's go ahead to number B, or the second one. Um, the political stakes is what I'm interested in. Um, and by political here, I mean uh, the effects of classical thinking versus quantum thinking on human beings themselves, on human subjectivity, not just in predicting our behavior, but the effects of actually these kinds of ideas on our nature themselves itself. And what I'm talking about here really is teaching and pedagogy. And what I'm interested in in the paper is the effects of teaching classical thinking versus quantum thinking on young children all the way up to graduate students. Um, and my suggestion in the paper, my, my contention, is that over the past two or three centuries, we've been teaching ourselves that the physics of our minds and the physics of society are classical. Decision theory, game theory, probability theory, everything else this is all classical social science we've been teaching our graduate students and teaching our children. Um, and my suggestion is not only is this um, scientifically inaccurate, that's what I'm gonna suggest anyway, I can't prove that, but that's my suggestion. But more importantly, um, as we all know, quantum computers are vastly more powerful than classical computers. And so by teaching ourselves that we are only classical machines, classical computers, if we're actually quantum ones, we are vastly understating our potential as human beings. Um, and so my intuition, my idea is that this is a tragedy, first of all, because we need all the collective agency and, and all the agency, individual agency we can find to deal with climate change and all the other global problems and so on. Um, but it's also a tragedy in the sense that we, our quantum nature is, which I'll suggest later in the talk, is by, is by nature more um, inherently cooperative than a classical nature would be. And so by teaching ourselves to think classically about ourselves, we're actually reducing our natural inclination to cooperate, to sort of have collective agency and so on. And that makes it more difficult, of course, to solve global problems. Um, so in that sense, the argument here is that classical thinking, which we've all grown up with and we've been taught in graduate school and, and ever since, the classical thinking really is false consciousness about the human condition. Um, and then if we see ourselves in classical ways, we're actually reducing or minimizing our potential as human beings. Um, and so the solution really is a new pedagogy, what I'm calling a quantum pedagogy, a quantum teaching, where we teach ourselves that we're actually quantum beings, if that's in fact the case, which we don't yet know. Okay, so um, in that sense, quantum social science in this conception is a kind of critical theory in the sense that it denaturalizes the classical picture, which we normally take as natural. And I'd suggest that in fact, it's wrong. Um, and the intention here is emancipatory to sort of liberate ourselves from false consciousness, okay? So that's kind of the general idea of the direction of the argument. But to do that, I have to do some setup first of all, as so I only get to that part of the talk, the important new part of the talk really in the second half. So I hope you just bear with me there should be plenty of time for Q&A um, at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to Roman numeral two. So the first step in justifying this whole argument is to justify the idea of bringing physics into social science at all. I think many social scientists, even positivists, will instinctively say, oh, we don't, want, we don't need to deal with physics. We don't wanna to have to deal with this. This is messy, complicated, and so on. Let's just leave physics out of it. What do physicists have to say about social life anyway? Um, and the reason to bring in physics, I wanna suggest, is in a, it lies in a philosophical principle um, 
that I think is actually at the core of modern science. And in that sense, I think is implicit in all of social science already. I think if you did, did studies or interviews with social scientists, almost all social scientists, if you press them, would agree with this principle. And the principle is the CCP, which is not the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's in fact the causal closure of physics. Um, and so let's define the, the, cause, the, the CCP. And the basic idea of the CCP is that there's really only one reality out there. The reality of physics describes that reality completely in, in one sense. Um, and so everything else that's out there in reality, for example, consciousness and the things in our heads like society or the state or R2P, all the stuff that social scientists study, which are all mental things in our heads, that all of this stuff that's in our heads and in our consciousness must exist somewhere in the physical world. Um, it must exist in the physical world. If it does not exist in the physical world, then it doesn't exist. So in that sense that what's possible in the physical world is a constraint in a sense on what social scientists can do and say that's still scientific, okay? Um, so in a sense, the idea here of the CCP is that everything, including the stuff of social science and consciousness, everything is physical. It must be physical, because otherwise, what else would it be? It has to be physical in some way. Now, it's important to emphasize this does not mean, this does not mean, in my view, that consciousness and social life and the this, this things that social scientists study um, are, um, can be reduced to the equations of physics. I don't believe that if you put physicists out there to study social life and they generated a bunch of equations, those equations would be meaningless. So physics is only relevant to social life if, if it can be translated into a narrative, into words, the kinds of things that social scientists normally build their theories out of, okay? Um, so the point being here is that the CCP is, is an ontological principle. It's not an explanatory one. It's not an epistemological one. It's not saying you must be able to reduce IR theory to physics. That can't be done because you can't reduce the things that IR scholars talk about, like in state intentions and the balance of power. You can't reduce any of that to physics, okay? The language of physics and the equations of physics. The only way you can talk about the IR world is in terms of narratives, okay? Um, so it's a principle of ontology, but not epistemology. It's not saying you have to be able to explain these things in physical terms. It's just saying that everything that IR scholars talk about is in some sense must be in some way physical, okay? Okay, and I emphasize that because sometimes people react to this talk and they, they think that I'm suggesting that we can get rid of IR and just have physics. No, we can't do that. Physicists have very little to tell us about IR. That's our job, right? But we need narrative to do that, not just equations. Okay. Um, so the point then, the larger point here though, and this is the, a key part of the argument, it's not that social science is reducible to physics. The point rather is that every social scientific theory, every single, every social scientific description of the world, including IR, must have a correlated, correlated physical description. So you come up with some theory of the causes of World War I, if you, if you could, there must be some way to translate that into the language of physics, okay? Because physics will also have a description of what happened in generating World War I, all right? If there's no such correlated description, then whatever the social scientist is saying is nonsense because it doesn't exist in the real world. The real world is ultimately physical, okay? All right. <laughs> so in that sense, the significance of the CCP is that it sets outer limits on what can happen in the social world and outer limits, therefore, on a valid social scientific explanation. For example, if physics tells us that what Einstein called action at a distance is impossible. If physics tells us that, well, then it's impossible. End of story, right? Social scientists can't say, well, it's possible in IR. No, you can't say that. Physics has the last word on this, okay? So on the other hand, if physics tells us that action at a distance is possible in the social world, that's a whole nother story. 
because social scientists don't generally believe that. So we'll come back to that later on. But this then raises the next question, which is which CCP, which physics constraint um, should social scientists observe? And since the 1920s, we've had two options, quantum and classical, and they have completely different ontologies of the physical world. Um, and therefore completely different constraints on what social science should be doing. And so the issue now is what kind of physicists should social scientists listen to? So we can go down to number B. Okay. So the classical, let's see, is there a number one underneath that? Let's see. Yes, there is. Okay, good. All right. So the classical answer is one of these two CCPs um, is represented by the classical physics of Newton and 19th century energy physics. Um, classical physics is familiar to all of us um, because it's the physics of macroscopic non-living objects. Uh, the physics of rocks, planets, glaciers, car engines, physical, classical physics is completely um, familiar. It's deterministic, it's um, materialist, it's reductionist, it's objectivist, and classical physics is all about causal mechanisms. Okay, I mean, you think about all the language in social science about causal mechanisms, that's all classical physics language, okay? And in particular, there's no action at a distance in classical physics. All causation is local. It's all mechanical, the way a car engine is mechanical. Now, importantly, classical physics works fantastically well for material objects, which is what it was designed for. People invented classical physics to describe the behavior of inanimate material objects, okay? And it's also important to emphasize that classical physics relies on the binary thinking of classical logic and classical probability theory because material objects obey the rules of classical object, classical logic, which is an either or object logic, and it obeys the, they obey the rules of classical probability theory. So this is the classical worldview in effect, okay? So let's turn to the second, the quantum answer. Um, it's a very different way to think about the physical constraints on social science and IR specifically. Quantum theory is consolidated in the 1920s, and it was a complete revolution in the way that physicists thought about reality. It subsumes classical physics at the limit, as a limit case, but otherwise it challenges almost every assumption of the classical worldview. Um, in contrast to the classical world of clashing billiard balls, and you think about IR as the kind of quintessential billiard ball kind of uh, story, it's a very classical kind of story. In contrast to that picture, the quantum world is physical because physics describes it, okay, but it's not material. And so I, in my book, I distinguish between physical and material and suggest that physical is a broader category. Material is kind of classical physical, but there's also quantum physical, which is fundamentally different kind of physical. It's not a non-material kind of physical. And not just non-material, but it's non-deterministic. Quantum theory is non-deterministic. It's relational or holistic. So all the relational, relational theory that's been um, percolating in IR the past decade, this is very much a quantum way of thinking. Um, it's a holistic way of thinking. And importantly, quantum thinking, as, as I've already suggested, allows for action at a distance or what's so-called non-local causation. Although there's nothing really causal about it because non-local causation is not mechanistic. It's the opposite of mechanistic, okay. And finally, the quantum view worldview, although this is very much debated or contested, the quantum worldview can in principle, in my view, uh, accommodate consciousness and inner subjectivity and all the things that go on inside people's heads, okay. And interestingly, in order for physicists, when they developed quantum theory, in order for them to even 
talk about the physical world, they had to develop a completely new logic, quantum logic, which is a logic of both and, and not logic of either or. So deep, at the deep down here, the difference between the classical answer and the quantum answer is that the quantum answer is both and, the classical answer is either or. If you had to sort of summarize this talk, maybe that's the simplest way to summarize it. Okay. But so quantum theory is completely different. It's a radically different way of thinking about the physical constraints on social science. The problem is it's very mysterious to physicists. Okay. The physicists agree on the math. Everybody agrees the theory works fabulously well. Um, but the physicists do not agree on what the math means, what quantum theory is telling us about the world. And when you read the philosophical debate, which has been going on now for almost 100 years, the philosophical debate about quantum theory, it's for a social scientist, it's kind of mind blowing to see how much the physicists disagree about fundamental questions about the nature of reality. It just, it makes our disagreements look trivial in a sense. We've got fewer disagreements than they've got and they're doing physics, okay? So, um, so in that sense, it's, here we are as social scientists, what are we supposed to do? The physicists don't agree, so what are we supposed to do? And um, you know, I think we don't really have any choice because no matter what we do, whether we stay classical or go quantum, we're making some kind of interpretation about the social world um, and we just have to kind of see what works the best, okay? So let me just give a brief example of what's at stake here. So let me turn to number three, okay. So there's been much discussion, certainly in the United States, the past few years about um, structural or systemic phenomena like structural violence, systemic racism, and so on. Um, and it's a very political debate, as I'll suggest in a second. And I think this is an interesting debate because it highlights the differences between a quantum view and a classical view of social world, social world. <clears throat> Um, so the question here is, what are the physics of structural violence or, stru or systemic racism or something like that? And if you're a classical person, um, where there are no invisible non-material objects because everything is material, okay? If you're a classical person, that at the end of the day, structural violence must be nothing more than a long chain of local mechanical violences by individuals against other individuals, okay? And so the idea that there's some kind of mystical social structure, um, oops, sorry, sorry. The idea that there's some kind of mystical social structure that's kind of forcing this to happen or producing this racism from the classical point of view is nonsense because where is that structure physically? It must be inside people's heads. It must be inside people's behavior. So it's all really about individuals, the classical view. It's mechanical and individualistic, okay? Um, and actually it's worth noting that the whole idea of structural violence is systemic racism. The very concept was introduced to get away from this kind of individualistic kinetic violence that the classical picture uh, gives us, okay? But the point being, is that the classical CCP, the classical version of a CCP tells us, I think, that structural violence does not exist. What exists is the violence of individuals. Okay, and that's a different problem than saying that structural violence exists or does not exist, okay? Um, and there's actually a famous quote that you may have heard from the former prime minister of Great Britain, uh, Margaret Thatcher, she was on record as saying, there's no such thing as society. Society basically does not exist. And that's a classical physical picture. All that exists are a bunch of individuals. And if those individuals get along, maybe they can have a society, but there's no such thing as society that's somehow above and beyond individuals. So from Thatcher's point of view, and of course she's a conservative politic politician, from her point of view, the political problems are not the system, the political problems are the individuals within the system who might be bad apples or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's kind of the classical picture. Structural violence doesn't exist. The quantum view, in contrast, says that, well, social structures might be invisible, invisible mental objects, but they are still real. They're real in a quantum sense as a non-local, 
social wave function that connects individuals through language, that we share a language and we share concepts about how society is organized, which gives meaning to our behavior, gives meaning to our ideas, and that those kinds of meanings, which are all social, that's what enables the individual actions that the classical view focuses on. So the violence of racism, for example, is partly local and kinetic, that's true. It's bottom up, okay? But it is also top down by the system itself when the system is understood as a social wave function in quantum terms. And now consider the politics of this. People on the political right tend to say that structural violence is nonsense and a bunch of whining by people that have no right to complain. And on the other hand, people on the left say it's all about structural violence. The individuals don't really matter a whole lot. Okay, so I mean, I'm character, caricaturizing, caricature, caricaturing, um, but that's I think you get the, the general idea. So this is a political debate, at least in the United States and probably elsewhere, but it's really a debate partly about ontology, about the ontology of society and the social life and what actually is real and what do we just imagine to be real but is not really real when you think about it. And that's, that's what's going on here. All right, so turn to number four then. So what's it going to be? So the issue question then is which CCP is the right one for social scientists? Because we're dealing with minds and society, we're not talking usually about material objects, we're usually talking about ideas, right, in our work. So which CCP is the right one for us? Another way to put this is do mental objects in our heads obey the same laws as material objects, or do they obey different laws, namely quantum laws, okay? Um, but either way, the CCP, tell, as a principle, says that social life must be governed by one physics or the other. Um, and to date, it's my own view, and just looking at the history of social science, it makes sense. To date, social science for the past, and for the past century and a half has been deeply classical in its core assumptions, right down to how things as basic as logic, probability, rationality, causation, all of these fundamental concepts of social science are deeply uh, infused with uh, classical thinking about the nature of reality. And that's not surprising. The social sciences were born in the late 19th century when classical physics was at its highest point. Okay? And like other new sciences, the social sciences drank the Kool-Aid that classical physics described the nature of reality, and that's all we needed to worry about. This was most obvious in economics, the so-called queen of the social sciences. But it's really not just economics. Uh, it's really anywhere now, nowadays anywhere, where um, graduate students take methods courses where methods means classical statistics, classical logic, classical game theory, classical decision theory. These are all methods we teach our graduate students. We never mention that the word classical is in front of all of them. Uh, we just say you're learning stats, you're learning logic, you're learning game theory, learning decision theory. Um, and in fact, you're learning classical versions of those things, not quantum versions. And that's very important as we'll see, okay? So the classical character of social science, I think is completely taken for granted in our training that we give to our students and therefore that we're teaching ourselves. We just take this classical stuff for granted. We don't even have to mention it because it's understood that we're talking about classical game theory and not quantum game theory. Okay, so in a sense then, despite the fact that the, quant the classical worldview died over a century ago in physics, and it's only used nowadays as a convenience, mathematical convenience, despite the fact that that worldview is dead, in social science, we continue to chain ourselves to 19th century assumptions about the physical world. And we do it completely blindly and unthinkingly, okay? Now, in fairness, there are many social scientists, maybe more in Europe than in the US, and, and I'm not sure about elsewhere, but, um, but in, there are many social scientists who have, and let's call them interpretivists, or in a general sense, who have not gone down this kind of classical um, positivist path for social science. And they've tried to carve out a non-reductionist, non-positivist kind of social science 
that is attentive to meaning, consciousness, inner subjectivity, and everything else that I'm implicitly talking about, okay? So these interpretivist social scientists and philosophers are out there. They're a minority in social science, obviously, um, but they've been a minority for over a century and they're still around and they're not going anywhere, okay? Um, but I would suggest, and actually constructivists in IR, a lot of constructivists I would put in that same category as sort of, um, less positivist than I was trying to be in my earlier work, okay? But even though these interpretivist scholars are very much um, against, in a sense, the classical picture that I was, I've been talking about, um, I think they too have been influenced by it perhaps more than they realize. And that's perhaps something we can talk about in the Q&A. Okay, so let's go to Roman numeral three. How are we doing on time? Well, I'm running, I'm, I'm okay. All right, so I'll try to be on this part, I'll try to be a little bit quicker than I have planned. But so before we go too much farther, I think it's important to acknowledge a very important objection to the whole idea of quantum social science as anything more than a metaphor. So I'm saying it's more than a metaphor. I'm saying social life really is quantum mechanical. Okay. And but it's it's possible to argue that's nonsense. There's an objection. Um, <coughs> And this is known as the decoherence objection. So if I could have number A, okay, the challenge of decoherence. And basically the idea, and this comes straight out of physics. The physicists themselves will tell you this and any classical social scientist who knows the physics will immediately go to decoherence to dismiss the idea of quantum social science. And the idea here, which, and this is what physicists have found in the lab is that quantum physics works extremely well for describing subatomic particles, um, where classical physics breaks down completely, okay? But above the molecular level, quantum effects wash out statistically, so they don't really have any meaning anymore. They, you can't even tell they make any difference. And that leaves classical physics to kind of take over at the macro scale. So that's why planets and pulleys and pistons seem to obey the laws of classical physics, even though they're made up of quantum constituents, because the quantum effects have all washed out at the macro scale in those objects, okay? So and that's, that process of washing out of the quantum effects is called decoherence. And this is a well-established empirical fact in, in the physics. Um, it's a reality that you cannot deny, okay? So the crucial question is, do these quantum effects also wash out in living organisms and especially human beings? In other words, do, is it possible that quantum effects scale up to the human level, even though they don't scale up in rocks and pulleys and pistons, okay? And in recent years, and for many, many years, people said, no way, there's no way that quantum stuff can scale up to the organism level. And therefore, quantum theory is irrelevant, irrelevant to social science. It's been the orthodoxy for almost a century, which is why the whole issue has never been talked about in social science. But in recent years, I think the tide has been turning a bit in, because of three bodies of evidence. And just very quickly, I'll mention these, and we can talk more in the Q&A if you want. And let's go to number B, problem solved. So these are three hints, really. They're just hints that maybe quantum stuff, quantum effects do scale up to the human level, which would allow us to be walking quantum computers, which is the metaphor quantum, or quantum wave functions. I prefer now quantum, we're walking quantum computers is my intuition, okay. And here are three, three hints that that's actually the case. Number one, let's see, is there a number one or not? No, okay, there's no number one. All right, so the first and very quickly, um, is that you have the rapid growth of the field of quantum cognition and quantum decision making in mathematical psychology, especially. And what the quantum cognition and quantum decision making folks have shown pretty convincingly is that the human mind and human behavior seems to follow quantum, quantum principles more than classical ones. In particular, quantum decision theory seems to explain all of the so-called irrational anomalies in psychology that Kahneman, Tversky, and other psychologists have documented thoroughly over the past 40 or 50 years. Um, 
And all of these anomalies apparently are explained or accounted for from a quantum, by a quantum version of decision theory or expected utility theory, which I think is an extraordinarily powerful finding, which has not yet seeped into the consciousness of social scientists, but it deserves to soon. Okay. Um, okay. Secondly, the second body of evidence, which suggests that maybe quantum effects. So, but the first body of evidence basically is saying human beings behave as if they're quantum. Okay. Which suggests that maybe there is a scaling up of the quantum uh, effects to the human level. The second hint is quantum biology. Uh, 25 years ago, it did not exist as a field. And now it's an explosively growing uh, scientific field. It's not social science, obviously. But what qu people have found is that biologists have found is that birds and plants and many other organisms use quantum dynamics, quantum effects to survive um, for navigation, for photosynthesis and so on, okay? And so if simple organisms like plants can use quantum processes to survive, you would think that kind of trait would be very useful in evolution. You would not expect that to be selected out by evolution. You would in fact expect evolution to amplify such a trait. Um, and so that's again, a hint that human beings, if plants can do it, then maybe human beings can do it too, namely think like quantum beings. And finally, and very quickly, and this is a more negative argument, a third hint, there is the continuing failure of classical uh, philosophy, classical neuroscience to explain consciousness. This is the mind-body problem. And as far as I can tell, the classical materialists have gotten nowhere in the past couple centuries on explaining what to me is the essence of human subjectivity, okay? Now, quantum theory, it's, it's very controversial whether or not quantum theory can somehow play a role in explaining consciousness. That requires a lot of interpretive uh, moves that are can easily contested, and we can talk about those things. Uh, but the important point for me, at least in my book, and, and I would continue to advocate this, is that if you put quantum theory with panpsychism together, and panpsychism is the view that consciousness goes all the way down in matter, um, then you have a solution to the mind-body problem and everything else kind of falls into place. Okay. But anyway, these three hints, all of them suggest that quantum theory is not just a physical science, but that quantum theory is actually a human science as well. Um, and the rest of my talk um, is going to sort of, which is, we're almost done, um, is going to assume this kind of general quantum framework. And then in, in my Q&A, we can flesh out some of it. But really what I want to do in the rest of the talk is lay out kind of a what if scenario, which is what if the idea of quantum consciousness and um, that human beings are quantum computers, walking quantum, what if these ideas are actually true? We don't know if they're true. Decoherence objection is still important. But what if they are true? What difference does that make? And that's really what the paper was trying to argue. Um, although most of my talk is really about the setup, but that's where the paper ultimately goes. Okay, so let's go to Roman numeral four, which is the last of the major parts here. So, and then number A. All right. Um, so I need to do a lot more reading on what's called critical pedagogy. I don't know anything about pedagogy, pedagogical theory, or at least I didn't know anything until a few months ago. Um, so, but the basic idea that I have here, I think is very simple. Um, it doesn't require any fancy theory to sort of articulate. And the idea is that, and it's really a what if, okay? The idea is that what if over the past two or three centuries, we have been, when we teach about the physics of society, the physics of social life, the physics and the physics of human behavior, and we never talk about that explicitly, but when we're teaching that implicitly to little kids and then kids in fifth grade and then college students and graduates, when we're teaching all through education, we're teaching our children, our young people about the physics of these things. Okay, when we do that, what we've been doing in my, this is my argument, is that we've been teaching our children that mental objects, the things in our heads, our ideas, and also therefore society, which is really just a shared mental object, we've been teaching our children 
that these mental objects obey the same laws as material objects like planets and um, glaciers and rocks, okay? And in particular, classical physical material objects, okay? Um, and I think that teaching begins in kindergarten or even maybe even at age one, and it goes all the way up to graduate school. And the idea here is that that kind of teaching at the margin shapes our minds. It shapes how we think about ourselves and it shapes how we think about each other. So you think about the idea of neuroplasticity that the brain over time actually physically evolves in response to different kinds of stimuli and so on. So that's kind of part of the story here, although I don't talk about that much in the paper, okay? But the point is, is that this training, which begins at age one and goes up to age 25 through graduate methods courses, all this training is teaching us to be classical subjects, to think of ourselves as classical beings, okay? Um, and actually there was very interesting work in economics, um, which shows that students who major in college and graduate school in economics over time become more selfish, more individualistic, more alienated and so on. They become more like, you know, homo economicus because they're getting that wired into their brain the more that they sort of teach, learn the stuff in their classes. So it's that kind of idea generalized to all people, all education about the physics of social life that I'm talking about. And the quantum argument, if the quantum idea of quantum consciousness and, and walking computers and so on, quantum computers is true, then this teaching is a fundamental mistake. It's a social misconstruction, a social misconstruction of nature, okay? <coughs> Um, and what it does is it produces people, subjects, us, um, with classical senses of ourself, a classical sense of rationality, a classical sense of logic, a classical sense of probability, and so on. And it represses our true quantum self, which becomes subconscious or unconscious. So we're repressing our, our it's really, Classical nurture is repressing quantum nature, is the, is the basic logic of my argument here. Um, and that to me is creating false consciousness about who we are or what we are in a physical sense. And that in turn limits human agency in ways that I'll suggest in a few minutes and human freedom. Okay. Um, okay, so let's turn to letter B, heading B, entanglement. Now, there are lots of ways that one could illustrate the general idea that I just laid out about pedagogy and subjectivity. Um, what I'm going to do is illustrate it with just one particular quantum concept, the concept of entanglement, um, because it's in Schrodinger's view, who is one of the, the founders of quantum theory, entanglement is the central concept of quantum theory. And also, it has very direct implications for the way we think about human individuality the way we think about liberalism, collectivism, and so on. So it has very direct political implications in a way that a lot of other co quantum concepts might not, okay? So uh, number one is definite, there should be a definition, here we go. Um, so entanglement is a form of connection, a non-causal holistic connection between particles in which a change in one is associated with an instantaneous change in another. So if you measure one particle, that causes that particle spin to change from up to down. That immediately causes the its correlated particle way over here, could be miles away or even light years away, to switch at the same time. Okay. So number two is the mystery. This is all very mysterious to physicists because how can you have connections that are not causal? It, it seems as if they go faster than the speed of light, but that's not what's going on. There's nothing happening that's faster than the speed of light. There's no transfer of energy or force or information from A to B, but the two particles seem to behave in some kind of correlated fashion. And that's the, that's the mystery of entanglement. Now in physics, it's very hard to make sense of that. It's just it's very counterintuitive because our everyday physics is the world of macroscopic objects and macroscopic objects are not entangled in that way. Okay, 
Um, and so Einstein actually was very critical of the idea of entanglement. He thought this was what he called spooky action at a distance. He thought it was all nonsense and that there was, this meant there was something wrong with quantum theory. So actually Einstein was against quantum theory in some ways at, at the end, okay? Um, but nonetheless, even though physicists have rebelled against non-local causation and action at a distance for decades, it's a well-established experimental fact, okay? So it's mysterious, but well-established. All right, number three, or banal. Okay, so in social life, I would say that entanglement is not mysterious. It's actually banal. It happens all the time, all around us, so much so that we take it completely for granted, okay? Um, and it happens through language. Language is what creates the entanglement between people and language and concepts in particular. And just a famous example that you know, philosophers, analytic philosophers have long used, uh, consider the case of Socrates and his wife Xantippe when Socrates is forced to drink the hemlock and commit suicide by the, I guess it's the Athenian authorities or something. So what happened to Socrates' widow Xantippe when Socrates died? She became a widow, obviously. But when did she become a widow? Well, the intuitive answer is she became a widow as soon as he died. But she may have been miles and miles away, and it might have taken her weeks to find out what happened to Socrates. Okay. So she doesn't know she's a widow, but she's actually a widow. And there are this kind of example where you get a change on one side. And there's through some kind of relational connection, like husband and wife, father, son, uh, citizen, state, and all kinds of relational connections. Through those relational connections, a change in one actor's status changes the status of other actors. At least in principle, that's how it's supposed to work. And it's a non-causal, it doesn't happen causally. It's not like Socrates' death caused Xantippe to become a widow. She became one by definition in that social community that recognized the institution of marriage and so on. So my intuition is that this thought experiment about Xantippe and Socrates is actually very general in social life. Um, it's not causal. And that um, from a classical perspective, it makes no sense. It's very hard to understand what happens to Xantippe if your picture is mechanistic and materialistic and so on. Um, Whereas from a quantum perspective, it makes perfect sense. It's a case of entanglement, okay. All right, number four. <coughs> entanglement is important for social scientists especially, um, for those who are interested in cooperation and collective action, which is, describes a lot of IR scholars, obviously, in particular. And the key point here, the, the starting point, is that entanglement is a variable. Entanglement is a matter of degree in social life. And in quantum world, you've always got some entanglement, but how much you have can depend. So it can be very thick or it can be very thin. Okay, whereas the classical world is by definition equals zero entanglement. So everything that's more than zero is the quantum world. Okay. And interestingly, quantum game theory, and there's a huge literature on quantum game theory, which has not yet penetrated IR at all. Um, Quantum game theory has shown that the more entanglement you have in any kind of game, like Prison's Dilemma, Battle of the Sexes, Chicken, whatever it is, in any mixed motive game, the more entanglement you have, the more cooperation you will get, other things being equal. So in effect, for any mixed motive game, quantum theory predicts that you will get more cooperation among the actors than classical game theory predicts. So in PD, one shot PD, you, you have to defect. We all know that. That's you know that's your freshman level uh, IR 101. In quantum PD, you play it one time. You don't have to defect, but it's not a case of playing a mixed strategy or anything like that. It's different than mixed strategies, and I can't I don't know the details, but anyway, it's different. Um, we can talk about that in the Q and A if you want. But the important point is that. Um, People, quantum theory predicts more cooperation than classical game theory predicts. And that's interesting because 
in what we observe behaviorally in experimental game theory and, and behavioral economics, what we observe experimentally is that in these games, human beings actually cooperate more than they're supposed to. They cooperate much more like they would be cooperating if they were quantum decision makers. I don't think that's yet been worked out the way quantum decision theory has, but um, the important point is the more that you have entanglement, the more you have potential for cooperation and collective action. Um, and that means perhaps solving big societal problems like climate change, pandemics, or whatever else might be the case. Okay. All right, let's go to number C. Oh, okay, the C is missing. Yeah, it's it's never mind. I'll just I, but there is a C there and oh there it is, rethinking individuality. Okay. So where all this comes together um, is in two different views of the human individual. Uh, the first, the classical materialist view, which I would say is the quintessential Western view of the individual, is atomistic and individualistic. And in particular, and this is the quantum jargon. Um, the classical view of the individual treats people, treats individuals as, quote, fully separable. We're totally separate beings. Our individuality is not in any way entangled, okay? My body, my brain, my head, everything is inside me, and that's totally separate from you. And you're over there, and I'm over here, okay? So who we are does not depend on each other. Who I am depends on me. And who you are depends on you, okay, physically speaking, all right. And this is basically the Hobbesian and liberal model of the human being um, in the state of nature before sociality kicks in and everything else. And the result, of course, as we all know in IR and, and, and political theory more generally, is a very conflictual view of society where the state of nature is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, kill or be killed, very alienated and so on. Um, and that's sort of where the classical picture of the individual leads, okay? In the quantum view, in contrast, um, the mind might still be inside a brain, okay? In one sense, which is inside our skin. Um, <coughs> but because the mind is a quantum mind, it's entangled with other minds through language in a non-local way. And so in that sense, from a quantum perspective, our minds extend beyond our skin. They're not just locked in our skulls. Our minds extend in a quantum sense, physically, beyond our skin. And actually Schrodinger had the view that there really is, quote, just one mind, that all human beings are really a part of one mind, right? And that's very much the idea that I'm trying to convey. So in that sense, there's a literal, if that's true, then there's a literal physical sense in which I am you and you are me. Or putting it another way, there's a physical sense in which who we are depends on who we are with. If I'm with one person, I'm one Alex, and I'm with someone else, I'm a different Alex, okay? Because at the quantum level, these relational connections are all about potentialities and uh, entanglement and so on, and that's what enables these kinds of connections to happen. And moreover, importantly, and this is kind of the political point, entangled minds and are more naturally predisposed to cooperate, as quantum game theory tells us, than the Hobbesian individualistic minds, which are competitive and self-interested, okay? So if we think of ourselves as entangled, that will increase our entanglement. The problem is that we've been teaching ourselves that we're only classical beings that I'm myself and I'm totally separate from you and vice versa. And that suppresses awareness of our natural physical entanglement and blunts its emancipatory potential. So my suggestion here, and I only have a minute to say it here at the end, is that what we need to do is to re-educate the human mind to see itself in quantum terms rather than in classical terms, assuming, of course, it is a quantum mind, which we don't know. So that's a big caveat. But what we need is, though, a critical or quantum pedagogy. Um, and if we start teaching ourselves that we're actually quantum beings, maybe that will increase our sense of entanglement 
And that will in turn make it easier for us to cooperate. And so instead of the individualistic classical view where conflict is the default and cooperation is the problem, in the quantum view, cooperation may be the default and conflict is the problem or the thing that doesn't happen very often or very easily. Um, so you change the self-consciousness and that may increase entanglement and then change the behavior and make it possible for us to solve social problems we cannot otherwise solve, okay. So uh, the point here then, just to wrap up, is not to change human nature. It's actually to liberate human nature in the sense of to recognize our nature for what it really is, which is quantum rather than classical, okay. Um, now, of course, it's not yet clear whether or not the human mind is quantum or classical, okay? So neither view is yet vindicated, but at the very least, I think we should begin talking about it because we've been ignoring quantum theory for a century in social science. Um, this is a way, I think, to recognize what's at stake and why we need to be part of this larger conversation. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I think I went over a little bit, but... Um, Hopefully that's okay. So let me just get some paper out here. Um, and that was the conclusion. So that, so I'm all done. Okay, okay. sorry. Yeah, okay. And I'm gonna try to um, see if, I, can I get most of these things off my screen? I mean, I, I would love to see all of your faces, but right now it's a bit hard for my, um, uh, I've been having some, well, I see that uh, there are 43 participants. Okay, there we go. Now I can, that's a speaker view. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Professor Wendt. Okay. For very insightful and illuminating arguments about quantum physics. While I was listening to your uh, lecture, I felt like, oh, I'd like to be reborn into a quantum world and get trained in that way, then how I would be different from what I am now and what would be in that world. Right. Right. I'm, I'm so curious about it. I mean, as I told you at the beginning, I feel that I was intoxicated by the classic thinking, classical thinking, or like, a, I mean, the, the dominant theories of international relations like uh, realism and liberalism. And these days I was uh, disheartened for two things, one, those uh, dominant theories like realism or liberalism, other mainstream theories uh, do not provide adequate explanation of what is going on around the world. Even though I have studied 40 years about those theories, myself have been difficult in doing so. On the other hand, the second point is that in doing so, I observe a kind of politics of discipline within the field of international relations. Those isms like realism, or liberalism, other isms, almost like a tribe, tribalism. I see a yeah. tribalism going on within this field. So when I try to what is called analytic eclecticism, I'm then attacked by both sides, from the both sides or right. every side. Right. <laughs> so even that, I, mean, I don't know what you mean because you are doing more radical approach to that um, attack on mainstream theories. So I mean, I would like invite Professor Sun Jae Sung. And uh, Professor John Jason, I mean, I have, you have been working, I think, a lot about this one, but I would like to ask you to your Korean students that how this quantum meta theory or metaphysics as an IA theory has a more relevance the way we think about international relations. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Wendt has some examples like uh, structural violences, as, uh, systemic racism, as uh, the way how you can approach those social issues from the quantum perspective, but what about some international relations phenomena like US silo arrival at this moment? But anyway, I, I'm gonna give the microphone to Professor John for 10 uh, more time for your own uh, thought about this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a second. Can you see me by the way? Yep, sure. All right, I cannot see myself, but that's okay. I don't need to see myself, but as long as you can see me, that's fine. Okay. First, uh, as an organizer and the discussant, I want to appreciate deeply uh, Professor Wendt's participation and uh, presentation. He had some uh, problems and conditions, but he adjusted his schedule several times. So I really appreciate 
uh, and his uh, presentation was very comprehensive, insightful. I think it is very helpful to the students as well as the South Korean scholars. So uh, in South Korea, there are numerous articles about constructivism so far and several ones about quantum uh, our theory, and I spent one or two weeks for teaching uh, your articles about uh, constructivism and quantum theory as well. So for the discussion, uh, I have no professional knowledge about you know, quantum physics itself. I'm a just a regular I. IR guy, but I my position is that I have a high expectation that uh, you are opening a new chapter and there will be a new and productive approach not just for social science, but also international relations. So as you said, uh, agnosticism is the current position and we have, to, we have to wait for some new achievements of quantum biology, quantum brain theory, and as you uh, explained, quantum-based social uh, science empirical theory. I think they are all fantastic. So you uh, opened the way for the more empirical theory so far, uh, and we have to stay tuned for more theories to come. I uh, heard that there are many criticisms and there are special uh, issues in many journals so far. So probably you have uh, ample criticism so far. I have a long held you know, complimentary questions. I don't know if this is relevant to you, but um, let me uh, raise four uh, you know, uh, points. The first one, is a rather simple one, the possibility or need to combine the quantum physics and classical one uh, to explain the consciousness and to make the uh, engineering. For example, in engineering, uh, we have a better result by combining quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, semiconductor, laser, all these things. So uh, the, the, there is some combination of between two paradigms to make things real. Also in human brains, uh, humans are, as you said, a walking uh, wave function, but I wonder that there is a brain evolution at the level of macroscopic level, which conforms to the classical physics. For example, the frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, which has been known to be responsible for rational thinking, which is specific to human thinking ability. So there must be some you know, classical level evolutionary need to develop such brain sub-organs and the way how the quantum brain function is integrated with this classical biological development, how they're combined may be worthwhile to delve into. So this is not about the ontological origin of consciousness, it's about more mechanical uh, aspect of the brain, how that works. So in that sense, the formula or thesis of how to combine the quantum perspective with classical one even though it explains the ontological origin of consciousness very well, I mean, the quantum perspective, but probably uh, we may have a better result by combining the classical level of neuroscience. You said 90% of neuroscience is classical based, but uh, if we wanna have a more perfect uh, explanation of brain, then probably we need a, a combination of both the physics. Is there any possibility or is there no need for that? That's my uh, first question. The second one is more difficult to me, uh, which is the difference between consciousness and the concept of self. You know, we talk various levels of consciousness. You touched upon that, the distinction among subconsciousness, unconsciousness and consciousness and so on. So relate to the very concept of consciousness, we have self-consciousness, which is the rel uh, reflective cap capability to be conscious of consciousness. Uh, we still do not know if this reflective capability is specific only to humans because we have uh, only third person uh, perspective. We do not know, we do not have first person perspective for other species or even other humans. You know, the philosophical zombie problem hypothesis and also Nagel's bad dilemma. But increasing researcher, uh, researchers in cognitive science tells that probably only humans have self-consciousness. Uh, we are not superior or fundamentally different from other species, but just evolved in this specific way you know, to have self-reflective consciousness. And also there is a growing body of literature that the very concept of self is groundless. Self is not real. It is just grammatical device 
Uh, we can think of many philosophers such as Daniel Dennett, uh, Thomas Metzinger, or Derek Parfit, also in IR, you know, Lebeau, uh, who talks about the ontological non-existence of self. So what we have is only a sense of self. The fact that we have consciousness does not testify to the fact that self is real. Uh, he also talks about you know, in, in various articles, the relationship between uh, consciousness of, and self. Uh, that's good, but uh, as my reading is limited, I wonder what you have more to say about this. Uh, and uh, the idea of identity and you know, a personal continuity, uh, the ontological security, all of these uh, concepts in IR are very important because we can start from the assumption that there is a self, you know, physical self, or uh, in terms of, you know, consciousness. But the question is, is only the sense of self is real? Is the concept of the self is constructed? The, the concept of self itself is constructed? And how is self made up by the mechanism of consciousness? So is there any uh, need to distinguish between the concept of consciousness and self? Uh, that's my second question. Third one is a more complementary one, the possibility of fully making use of quantum theories in social science. So, so far you have developed very useful several social science empirical theories, uh, such as decision theory, but there might be more. So I think of, you know, Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, you once mentioned him as a scholar who positively responded to the quantum physics. Uh, he suggested that synchronicity, not causality, may be one of the principles of how the universe, universe is organized and connected. So this idea close to quantum entanglement or Bohm's, you know, David Bohm's idea of enfolded order also in uh, QMAS, in your book, you mentioned the possibility of retro causality or downward causation, you know, uh, you know that, so which is fantastic. But how to apply all these concepts uh, from quantum physics to social science beyond you know, metaphorical and logical level to the real level still needs some more work. So how can we you know, make full use of the quantum physics and what is the standard of doing that? Uh, that's third. Fourth one is a little bit uh, strange, but as you mentioned, the uh, I am new kind of, you know, worldview, uh, this is easier. So this could be somewhat, you know, far-fetched. But as an Asian, you know, I'm curious about the possible, possible link between religion and quantum. So you probably know that these days, you know, cognitive scientists research you know, various states of consciousness, such as dream states, or to the state of consciousness, out-of-body experience, you know, near-death experience, and all those things, but very interesting, and meditation. So those of real state of consciousness, even though they are not common, and some of them need training, uh, I think still we don't have any reasonable physical basis to explain these, you know, phenomena so far. Uh, but what if uh, there is a new physics in the future, beyond quantum, or including quantum, uh, the next level of physical theories, which can provide the basis for this, you know, seemingly strange uh, in a mental phenomenon. Uh, you know, uh, if we look at the quantum, the history of quantum physics, uh, you know, quantum-like social phenomena actually existed before the invention of quantum physics, in the 1920s, as you see, in the 19th, in the 19th century, probably there was a, a quantum-based, you know, social phenomena we can witness. But with the development of quantum physics, now we have a physical grounds, uh, the causal, you know, completeness, cause closure of quantum physics. So currently, uh, seemingly unscientific human aspects of consciousness may have new physical grounds in the future. Uh, now in physics, you know, there is a old question of how to invent the theory of everything, you know, how to combine gravity and quantum theory. Uh, physicists propose a very strange hypothesis of string theory or M theory, which suggests theoretically 11 or even 12 dimensions. So our strange states of consciousness are still the phenomena, uh, physical phenomena in the universe. Uh, they are real ones, but lacking physical explanation so far, waiting for the next level physics maybe after quantum physics. So if this makes sense, you know, we probably need to focus on seemingly unscientific or not yet scientific human phenomena of consciousness 
which leads to the question about the relationship between religion and consciousness. This may sound absurd, but you, uh, you know, mentioned the pedagogical ideas, which is, I think, also very interesting. So uh, do you think this makes sense? Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Okay, uh, Professor John raised uh, four points, uh, questions or uh, comments. I think uh, I would let uh, Professor Went to respond to your comment before we go mm -hmm. on to the floor, because your question was quite complex. So uh, Professor Went, would you respond to his comment? Yeah, and I, those, I can't do justice. I mean, they're, they are complicated, hard questions, so I cannot possibly do justice to them. But let me just give you a quick sense of the direction I would go if we had a longer, if we, if we were having dinner and we could talk about it over you know, a glass of wine. Um, so on the first question about combining classical and quantum, um, and especially as we think about the brain and, and everything else, uh, this is yeah, this is a very hard question. Actually, it's interesting that the quantum consciousness and quantum brain literature hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about that because they're so they, they still have to figure out how there could be any kind of quantum stuff going on at all in just the quantum part of the story. So they haven't, there's not as much literature on how this interfaces with the classical part of the brain, but clearly the brain is also a classical object. So in a sense, if you think about what a quantum computer, a quantum computer is a classical shell that protects the coherence, the quantum coherence or the, or the, the quantum state inside the computer, the classical machine. So likewise, the brain is some kind of classical structure that protects quantum coherence at its core would be the intuition. So how that works, I have no idea. I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, I don't think anybody knows yet, but there, are, there is some literature that addresses this. Um, but it is interesting, and in, in actually in social science, we're seeing a lot of interest in brain chemistry and, and uh, the so-called social neuroscience, mirror neurons, and all this kind of stuff, which has been happening the last 10 or 15 years. I had a PhD student or two interested in this kind of work. That's all classical work. It's not quantum, but it is interesting in that social scientists are getting into neuroscience is the point. And so hopefully, maybe they'll get into quantum neuroscience as well. So, but that's a hard problem. How do you put them together? And that's a real issue. Okay. Um, Secondly, on the consciousness versus the concept of the self, um, that's very interesting. And I think it's very important to distinguish the concept of identity from the concept of self, which I would argue is a higher order concept. And one self can have many, many different identities, whereas you can still be the same self. Um, you know, to me, from a quantum perspective, the most natural interpretation of the self is as a wave function. So it's not real, real in the classical way. Um, you can't point to it and say, oh, there it is right there. Because if it's a wave function, it's really just a potential. But a wave function has structure to it. And so the interesting thing about the self is that even if it's not real and it's just a potentiality, it does have structure. It makes certain things impossible. You know, My sense of myself makes certain kinds of behavior like murdering somebody basically impossible, right? That's probably true for most of us. For some people, the murderer, their sense of self is very different. Their sense of self makes it possible to kill somebody and so on. So, um, so I would say that the self is playing a probabilistic role, so to speak, from a quantum perspective in you know, making certain kinds of actions more likely than others, but then that's all probabilistic. It's not deterministic. And how that's connected to consciousness, I'm not sure. I would say as a wave function, it's by definition not conscious because consciousness is when you the wave function collapses. So the, I would say the self is always in the background. And anytime you think you're looking at the self, you're actually not looking at it would probably be the way of this. And this argument is not just quantum. I would say that 20th century social theory, a lot of 20th century social theory goes that direction too. On the third point about um, how to go beyond metaphor, that's very hard. I mean, I think the synchronicity issue um, I would put that in a separate category from other kinds of quantum effects. I mean, synchronicity is clearly about entanglement. There's much more debate about whether synchronicity actually exists or not. Um, whereas the more standard quantum concepts, everybody agrees these things are real, so to speak. Um, so I would want to maybe put a, I mean, I personally think secret synchronicity is likely to exist, <coughs> but it may be in a separate category. Um, but in terms of what's the standard for going beyond mere metaphor, 
No one's ever asked me that before. That's actually a really good question. And that's a really important question. And I do not know how to answer that. So I'm going to make a note of that one and think about that one in particular. OK. Um, and then finally, religion and quantum. Um, you mentioned near-death experiences. There's interesting work in the past five or 10 years on quantum theory and near-death experiences and how quantum theory can help us understand these kinds of things. Um, so it may be that there is a physical explanation for some of these phenomena that in the past have not looked scientific, okay? Um, and that's my own expectation. Um, and, you know, near-death experiences especially, you know, I mean, it, the, the, you're never gonna get, get an explanation for those from a classical mechanical picture of the brain. I think only a quantum view has any hope of explaining such experiences. I don't know if a quantum view can do it either. Maybe we just need more physics. Um, in terms of the, the, the larger connection to religion though, it's very important to emphasize that the founders of quantum theory, many of them themselves looked to uh, Buddhism and Taoism in particular um, and then starting in the 1920s and going up you know, to many decades later for inspiration to help understand the quantum world. So there's always been a very powerful connection between quantum theory and what skeptics have called mysticism, but others would call religion in maybe a non-Western sense of the word religion and so on. Um, so that's always been very powerful and there's a lot of connections. And one, I have a PhD student who's you know, basically reading Chinese foreign policy in terms of Taoism and quantum. And it's fascinating that the connections he's showing me that Taoism and quantum theory have a very deep similarity at, at their underlying structure. So um, that's something I don't know much about, but I think is very productive and interesting to look at, especially for IR people where religion may be affecting worldviews of different states, right? So if, if the West is looking at the world in terms of a primarily Judeo-Christian kind of worldview religion, and China is looking at the world primarily in terms of a Taoist kind of perspective, that may be very different in terms of, of the kinds of interactions you would get than you might otherwise have. So but I'll leave it at that. I don't want to talk too much. And so I want to open it up to questions to anybody else, so. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, open the floor to, to everybody online. Is there anyone who has any question, please? Uh, is there, I mean, here so there is a way that they can signal they are uh, interested to like to talk, right? Uh, Hello. Yeah, there, there is an engineer, okay. Uh, hi, uh, Professor, Professor Wendt. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, presenting here today. And I would like to personally thank for uh, uh, Korean Association of International Studies for hosting such a fantastic, uh, you know, <laughs> well-known figure uh, in the field. Well, I uh, personally read this book, I think, in my memory uh, when I was uh, finishing, completing my PhD thesis. And I think it's conceptually fantastic. Uh, it's, it, it, it poses ontologically very important questions. And at the same time, I agree most of your ideas, um, especially the concept of entanglement. Well, I think that's the uh, the way to evade the trap of becoming a atomist or a structuralist. You're trying to find a middle ground. I think that's probably a response to uh, your uh, previous work, um, uh, the, the work on constructivism. Uh, well. Uh, while agreeing most of your ideas, well, I have one very simple question, and I think uh, it's a, a question, not a criticism, because I think probably, you know, maybe you, you, you well, 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 forget, let's forget about that. So my question is, well, uh, it's about the predictable quality of your uh, approach. Well, while uh, the quantum theory provides a, a very fine and deep insights about uh, how this world is constructed, uh, the providing ontological questions and so on. Uh, and this means I think uh, the, the theory's explanatory value is fantastic. It, it, it provides a very totally different well, way of thinking uh, to the audiences of international relations uh, theorists or others in general. But how about the predictable uh, value of this theory? Well, maybe this is a nonsense question because you have suggested that uh, uh, quantum theory does not try to determine something 
which is going to be going to happen in the future. But at the same time, what I personally faced in many times when I was, uh, well, personally working on my own projects, uh, many people have uh, provided me with such a critiques saying that, well, you know, you know, this kind of approach does not provide any predictable values. Therefore, uh, this loses some, well, uh, fun well, values as a theory or some kind of analytic tools. So, uh, well, I am still, you know, well, trying to figure out to deal with such challenges, but uh, still finding it difficult to do. Uh, so what would you be your um, personal strategy to deal with such an issue? Okay, no, that's a good question. Um, and I guess I would say that, I mean, as you know, quantum theory itself is fundamentally probabilistic. It, it does not claim to be able to predict particular outcomes. If you think about the double slit experiment, the two slit experiment, it cannot tell you where the particles will actually hit on the screen. It just, it doesn't do that. And it's saying you can't do that. And there's a limit to human knowledge that just makes it impossible to do that. So in that sense, it's, it's not predictive in the, in the point prediction sense. On the other hand, if you think about quantum decision theory, which is a quantum version of rational choice, basically, and that's what the mathematical psychologists have developed, which I mentioned in my talk, um, it, it actually predicts aggregate human behavior much better than this traditional rational choice does, but it does so probabilistically. So it gives you tendencies. So the tendency of the human being in the aggregate is to go this way with certain kinds of decision or cognitive problems. And that's in fact what we observe. Um, so it, it, which we don't observe, I mean, from the classical perspective, they don't have a good explanation for these tendencies. And that's why they're considered anomalies. They're considered irrationalities. You know, these are, these are um, problems in human cognition, which presumably are dysfunctional in some way. Um, in the classical view, in the quantum view, this is what we would expect. And that's what the math shows us when you ma match the math against the behavior and all the, the experimental evidence, it lines up quite well. So in that sense, it is predictive in the aggregate, just probabilistically, um, and it's better than the classical alternative. And best of all, one theory, namely quantum decision theory, explains all these different anomalies you don't need to have an ad hoc theory for each anomaly. You've got one theory, it explains everything. So, I mean, that to me is kind of the gold standard, um, and, but it is inherently non-deterministic. And that means that the future is open. And actually in the book, I argue in chapter 10, which is my favorite chapter actually, that the past is open too, because the past is itself changing to some extent um, through our actions today. So I'll leave it at that though. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, anyone else? I see a couple of hands up on the top left. Okay, I see uh, on the top. Yeah, Jung Dayun, is that you have a ra raise your hand? Okay, go ahead. And I see uh, C Inho. So mm -hmm. after Jung Dayun, C Inho, you go on and we will accept the two questions and then uh, let Professor Wendt respond to your questions. Okay. Dayun okay. first. Um, okay, hello. I'm Tayan from Korean University. First, thank you for class for, for um, this fabulous seminar. And um, I'm such I'm so delighted to see you, Alex, he, uh, here in Korea. Actually, I've been to um, boot camp. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So um, after the boot camp, I kept I kept studying this quantum social theory and had some few questions. And I would like to ask three questions. First one is about um, IR. Uh, I was wondering how do you see um, what determines the action or strategy of the state in quantum social science? Uh, I remember that you uh, you mentioned about the hologram and collective consciousness, things like that. And, uh, and I want to specify my question in point of panpsychism. Um, um, if, if states have also, uh, if states also have consciousness uh, in the view of panpsychism, then what could be, uh, what would determine the, um, um, action and strategy of the state. Uh, this is my first question. And the second question is, 
is like overall about the quantum social science. Um, as you know, there are so many different interpretation of quantum theory itself in physics. And because if uh, uh, and because if there is different interpretation um, in quantum language, then I'm afraid uh, that we have no shared premise uh, premise among um, future co uh, quantum social scientists and how do you think we should deal with this problem? And the last one is uh, more uh, about the boot camp. Uh, personally, I thought that um, I could relate to your point of this whole new um, fantastic worldview that consciousness has got to be the, in the picture uh, of IR and all the social science. Uh, and uh, that's one of the points why I'm so much attracted to the quantum things. However, um, I think neuroscience also explains about the conscious and other scholarly debates. So, uh, however, my speculation is that uh, neuroscience itself is based on the classical worldview, which makes quantum theory more elegant to say, uh, to uh, so to say. So, uh, I thought in this uh, in this regard, quant uh, social uh, bootcamp was the perfect place for the future uh, quantum social scientists to um, share their points and learn about it. And is there gonna be any similar events like this uh, besides a bootcamp, or are you planning some kind of programs for this? Yes, that's my planning question. some kind of what? What was the last part? Or planning I, some what? Uh, some kind of pedagogical programs okay. or. Okay. Okay. You know, All right. you know, you 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 can talk now. Okay. Uh, well, I wonder oh, actually. You. Wait. I wonder if I should. That was a lot right there. I wonder if I should just answer her questions first, okay. and then um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll try to be quick. Um, so on what determines the actions of states? That's an excellent, and how that connects to panpsychism, I'm not sure how that connects, it does connect, to, everything is connected to panpsychism, but I'm not quite sure how to work it into an answer. Um, but what I would say in my general view is, and this has been, it's actually a different view than I used to have, it's really ever since I started thinking about quantum, um, what determines the actions of states, I would say are decision makers. It's the actual individuals who embody the state holographically, so to speak, um, in their body, literally. and. So I think actually um, that the actions of the state are at the end of the day, not determined until the leader says so. So the leader I think has responsibility um, in some kind of a Schmidtian sense of, of, of sovereignty or something. Um, and so I think in that sense, nothing is determined until it actually happens. And that means leaders are responsible. And they're, they're, if things go badly, it's their fault. I'm sorry. So it's just, I think it's very much about the individual leaders who, of course, are empowered you know, through entanglement to command millions and millions of people. But I, I think individual leadership matters very much more in this perspective on the state than I used to think it did, which is much more of a corporate state. On the second issue, multiple interpretations of quantum theory, I agree, this is a huge issue. Um, it's worth pointing out that most, most of the interpretations that are out there, I don't know, maybe there's about a dozen or something like that, maybe a bit more, most of them never talk about consciousness. Consciousness is not even part of the story. Um, and I would say all of those, we can just assume are wrong because they have no place for consciousness. So if you eliminate them, then you've got various panpsychist stories and other stories that are kind of other interpretations where consciousness is central. Um, which I think fit much more naturally to social science. Um, and there, I think you might have enough common ground. Um, so, but I agree, this is, a, this is a crucial issue. It's interesting that in the quantum decision theory literature though, they never talk about consciousness. They're talking about quantum cognition, like a computer as cognition, and they talk about behavior and what they observe in the experiments. So they kind of skip the consciousness part, but they can still use quantum theory to explain behavior. So. Um, and I've talked to some of them about this. Why don't you talk about consciousness? And they say, well, it's kind of fuzzy and no one really knows what it is and we can kind of ignore it, right? And I kind of get that. Um, but I think that, um, <coughs> um, I forget where I was going with that, but I'll leave it at that. So anyway, I'll end that one. And then the third one um, about neuroscience being, yeah, neuroscience today is very, very classical. 
Um, but there's more and more quantum neuroscience going on, quantum brain theory. Um, not a lot, but there's more and more stuff and it's being done by some very high-end people. Um, the difficulty is partly just that the science is very hard to get access to people's brains at that level of detail um, without killing them. Because actually, if you interfere with a person's brain to that extent, their wave function is gonna stop for good. Um, so you can't really do that. Um, IRB won't let you do that. But um, so yes, I think neuroscience is gonna need to be transformed, um, but that's beginning to happen. And I just, there's a really cool article by a couple of physicists, one at Caltech and one at Harvard, uh, which is looking at quantum brain theory and in, in 50 pages of physics, just 50 pages long of physics, looking at quantum brain theory in, in a serious way. And um, so this is being done by serious people and it's just a matter of time before we see more and more of it, I think. So I'll leave it at that, so, okay. Okay, is that enough, uh, Diane? Okay, uh, let me go to, to Inho. Uh, I'm afraid uh, Alex did not answer to my the last question about the pedagogical program. Oh. Or, yeah. <laughs> Um, the pedagogical, what was the question, what part, oh, the QB, uh, about, about the boot camp thing and all that. And, yeah, um, yeah. What we're, we're doing boot camp again this summer. Um, we're going to add some new bells and whistles. Um, there's no, um, what I would like to do, I think that what I would like to do is find a way to sponsor some prizes. We, for example, we need a quantum deterrence theory. Deterrence theory should be quantized, for example. Any formal theory that we have in, in IR right now that's rational choice, quantize it. That's an article right there, or that's a book right there. So if you're looking for publications, quantize some rational choice theory, and you've got some publications. Um, so there is a, a part of the pedagogical strategy will simply be show what this stuff can do when you take something that's already been done and you change some of the assumptions, to quantum assumptions, and then you can see what kind of effect that has. So. But that's just the beginning. The pedagogical thing, I'm just beginning to wrap my head around. You know, it means re-educating kindergartners. And I don't really know how to, to you know, my own kindergartners, <laughs> they barely survived parenting. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens next. Okay, I'll leave it at that. You know, quantum yeah, theory deterrence is exciting one to, to see. Um, I can't wait. But anyway, uh, you have been waiting for long, you know? So yes. my question is yours, you know, go on. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you, Professor Rent, uh, for the presentation. Uh, so my question is about the uh, concept of mind in your interpretation of quantum theory. So I think you say something like, I, I don't remember the name, but you quoted like a, a theorist who said uh, there is just kind of only one mind. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then you also say uh, uh, in, uh, in the quantum theory, mind is just kind of uh, potentiality and potentiality is just uh, so uh, it's so those two statements seems to imply the mind is not really something like kind of identity or like the cell. It sounds more like kind of just kind of some kind of mental capacity to uh, do something or kind of think something. Uh, which really doesn't have anything to do with like kind of sense of self or, or identities. Do you think that's a sort of like better way of uh, think, uh, thinking about the mind? Just to think of it as a kind of pure kind of mental capacity, uh, which doesn't really have anything to do with like identity or, or does it also kind of have something to do with identity? Well, I guess I think you're, my my instinct is that you're partly right and and partly I might I'm not sure um, the part that I think that you're that you're right about is that um, the mind from a quantum perspective if it's a wave function or if it's a quantum computer then it does not have well it never has well defined attributes I mean it only has well defined attributes well defined qualities when it collapses into action which is happening constantly. So there's a constant rolling action that this wave function in our brains are kind of generating all this action. Um, but the mind itself, which is this wave function that's generating it, is a structure of pure potentiality, which is a phrase that you know quantum theorists, many quantum theorists would use. It's a potentiality, it's not an actuality. 
So the mind is not actual, it's always potential. And so it's potential in a probabilistic sense. So it kind of steers or pushes behavior in a certain direction. Um, but there's still the choices of the actor themselves that are making the behavior real. So I, I like what you were saying about it, it the mind being a potential, because I think that's crucial. It's not actual at all. It's actually, because if it's always potential, it's always the individual's responsibility to decide how they're going to act. You know, in the classical view, it's if my brain's a machine, well, I can't control a machine. I just do what I, my machine programs me to do. And that seems problematic. So, um, but as for the self and the identity concepts, to me, um, I would say those are, um, you know, the self and the mind, I would say, are pretty, they're working at the same, pretty much at the same level. They're pretty broad concepts that encompass perhaps a lot of what goes on inside our heads, but they're not the same. Identity, as I was suggesting earlier, is a more specific, you know, there are many, many different identities in a given self, but even the word identity is itself a wave function. So if you have an identity of being a citizen of, of South Korea, that can mean different things, perhaps, um, or, or um, you know, being an employer, or whatever the identity is, these identities are themselves potentialities. They're not rigid. They're not, they don't force you to behave a certain way. Even a soldier in the military can um, perform his or her duty in different ways. So even there, where it seems like it's a very deterministic environment, a very classical environment, individuals can still perform their identities in a more um, uh, probabilistic sense. So I would say the self and identity are themselves should be quantized and treated as quantum concepts, which means their superpositions, their potentials, they play the explanatory role that potentials and superpositions play in quantum theory. Um, but that they're still in some sense, well, they're not real, real, but they're real in a quantum sense, I guess, if I can, if that makes any sense. So I'll leave it at that. I'm not sure if that begins. I mean, it's a hard question, but um, <laughs> So, all right. I see the Hyunsu is raising hand. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 thank you for the mind blowing presentation, Professor Wendt. My name is Hyunsu Kim, as you know, and studying IR theory in Seoul University, Seoul National University, based on meta theory, especially ontology and epistemology. Uh, I, I would like to ask you uh, what is the differences between the ontology that quantum based CCP gets and the ontology of non-epistemic method, which neo-positivism is based on. Uh, in my view, non-epistemic method assume, assume that the ontological things, which cannot be captured, measured these days, but will be observed in the future someday. I reckon that quantum-based CCP also claim that the things which cannot be observed ex observed uh, exist and can be measured in the different quantum way. So could you tell me the uh, differences between quantum based CCP and the non epistemic method? So I'm not sure what you mean by the non epistemic method. So I'm struggling a little bit with part of your question. I have something I could say about um, things cannot be measured. But if you could maybe say a bit more about what you mean by the non epistemic method, I haven't heard that phrase before. So mm. Uh, I, I see that uh, Patrick Jackson categorizes the uh, non-epistemic method which uh, neo-positivism -posit uh, used to uh, claim their ontology based on their uh, positivism. So yeah, this is what I ask you about. Okay, well, I, 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 it's been a long time since I read Patrick's book and so I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I understand his, his idea well enough to really respond to it here. Um, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, there is a question about whether you can observe certain things and in, in, in scientific realists for a long, and even in my earlier work, of course, as a scientific realist, I argue, well, all these structures are unobservable, you can't see them, but they're real, right? Well, that's, that's kind of nonsense, actually. If you, if, from a classical perspective, that doesn't make any sense at all. How can they be unobservable? If they're real, they got to be observable, right? Um, so it's only if they're quantum that they could be unobservable. But if they're quantum, you can't measure them directly. Because as soon as you measure them, you cause them to collapse. Um, so it's, it's, it becomes much more tricky. But um, so there is, a, in that sense, there's a big difference between the classical and quantum CCP. Um, but I don't think I'm answering your question because I don't re remember Patrick's or Jackson's work well enough to, to 
uh, really answer it properly. So but feel free to send me an email. Actually, anybody, you should all feel free to send me emails afterward. And I'm, if I get too many, I can't respond, but I'm happy to answer a few questions by email because I'm sure we won't have enough time tonight. So. Oh, nice of you for doing that. Uh... I see you well, actually Yang Su wanted to say one more thing, it looks like. Oh, where did she go? There she is. I see Yong Jae Yang. Is it Yong Jae Yang? Uh yeah, thank you for a fascinating and thought-provoking okay. talk, Professor Vent. Uh I'm Chae Young, uh, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, I'm working with Professor Karin Firke. Actually, oh, NASA, I'm well, very I lucky to learn, yeah, I'm very lucky to learn your uh, quantum theories, also from Professor John, who is former uh, supervisor, <laughs> uh, and who, who is former my supervisor. And I have uh, two questions. One is that uh, whether quantum theories talk about emotions and feelings, because I, as far as I understand that we can talk about human beings as a feeling, walking, uh, wave function, quantum wave function. So what if we quantize, quantize our understanding about how humans feel, uh, such as from quantum neurosciences theory, or so I wonder whether you could introduce some literature which explores this question. And second question is that uh, you briefly mentioned that interpretist, interpret, I'm sorry, interpret Interpretivists in social mm -hmm. science tend to rely on classical physics, not to mention positivists in from uh, main, mainstream theory. Uh, as you explained, we can understand Lear social structure as a non-local wave function through language and quantum. So I think that how we understand language is pretty important for uh, interpretivists. Mm -hmm. So. I wonder whether you could talk more about how we can revolutionize this tendency of doing research about language and human actions beyond classical point of view. Thank you. Um, okay, the second one, I'm not sure I can answer, but let me start with the first. Um, so I guess I would say that if emotions, and there's debate about what exactly emotions are and how they should be defined, to me, the concept of emotion must have the concept of feeling in there, must have the concept of experience as part of the concept. So to me, emotions, they may be more than feelings or more than experiences, but they've got to have an experiential or feeling first person perspective kind of component. And so in that sense, emotions are fundamentally tied to consciousness. If, if a, something is incapable of consciousness, like a machine, it is incapable of emotions. So um, conscious and emotions and feelings all go together. So then the question is, is there a classical theory of consciousness? No, we don't have one. That's the mind-body problem. We haven't had a classical theory of consciousness that made any sense ever. Um, and it seems like the classical crowd is stuck. They're not getting anywhere anymore. Now, is there a quantum theory? Well, there are a lot of questions and a lot of problems, um, but I think it's much more compatible with the quantum perspective especially if you bring in the panpsychist story, this kind of a metaphysical assumption, um, that if you wanted to talk about feelings and experiences, the only way to do it is in quantum terms, because a classical machine can't have feelings, it can't have experiences. So I'm skeptical that anybody, that the classical neuroscience crowd and the classical philosophers of mind, I'm very skeptical that they will ever explain consciousness from a classical perspective. I think it's just a dead end. Now, what do I know? I, they're the experts, and I'm what I'm just a political scientist. But you know, I've read some of this stuff, and looking at it from the outside, doesn't they're not going anywhere. It's, it's like IR. I mean, I remember what Kenneth Waltz apparently said about IR, which is that nothing ever accumulates, not even criticism. So we don't get anywhere in IR. And I think that the classical brain people are in the same situation. Um, now, in terms of the second question, I didn't take enough notes to actually remember the question, except that it was about interpretivism. Um, so if you want to quickly repeat the second question, I'll give it a shot, but I'm not sure I can do it. Uh, yes, my question was about whether we, whether interpretivists in social science can go beyond uh, our reliance on classical physics, whether how, how uh, we can actually approach language and and Lear, social science, not, not 
material physical social science uh, from a class from a quantum point of view? Well, um, I mean, in a sense, just by doing discourse analysis and linguistic, um, you know, studies of meaning, all you know, all the things that social interpretivists have been doing all these years, it seems to me that that kind of work only makes sense from a quantum perspective. So the real challenge is to not let classical um, assumptions contaminate our thinking about language. So we don't want to bring in a language of causal mechanisms. Language and discourse are not a causal mechanism, but that's classical, right? So you want to strip out the classical stuff that might contaminate the, the, a linguistic, more linguistic story. Um, but then I would say, so there's that kind of, that's more of a defensive kind of strategy, but on the offensive side, in, in the good sense of offensive anyway, not offensive, but offensive, um, I would look at the work of Diederik Arts at the Free University of Brussels, is that what it is? Um, and he's been written a lot, he's a physicist, he's written tons and tons of articles about language and quantum theory. And he, what he shows in incredible detail, and it's fascinating, he takes concepts and he shows how the meaning of a concept depends on how it's situated in relation to other concepts. It's a total entanglement story. Um, and so looking at his work and the work of some of his students now who are also looking at the role of the, role of the idea of language from a quantum perspective, and Arts is actually convinced that language offers us insight into the interpretation of the quantum theory itself. Um, so he's kind of turning the ball, turning the game around and saying that, you know, concepts are, are quantum phenomena and we can interpret quantum theory through these um, quantum concepts. So, um, <coughs> so Arts' work, I think, is very interesting if you want to go beyond, but it's very technical. And so for IR people in particular, I don't know how much value there is in going too much into detail, um, but getting a feel for what he's doing and what he really shows is that concepts, no concept has any essential meaning. All concepts, their meanings depend on how they're actualized in particular situations. It's all contextual. So meaning is completely contextual, I think is the lesson of quantum approaches to language, which you know a lot of linguistic philosophers would already tell you, but now we have a physical story to back up that particular interpretation of language. All right, uh, it's all, almost two hours already. Uh... I would ask if there is anyone else who would like to ask what torture Professor Wendt on this rare opportunity to do so. I'm holding up fine. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, let me just go through. Is anyone? Mm -hmm. If not, uh, this is, I think this is near 10 o'clock at Columbus time, isn't it? That's almost 10 o'clock, yes. Yeah, here you're almost uh, 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 towards uh, noon, so lunch time. But uh, let me, before close out, let me uh, raise a question. Um, not a very informative one because not, I'm not a quantum theorist at all. Mm -hmm. But the first reference to quantum theory by international relations scholar was, as far as I remember, was uh, Hans Morgenthau. Yes. In his book, uh, Social uh, Scientific Man versus Social, I mean, Power Politics. Uh, I think that the, his intention was he lashes out those uh, people who were trying to build a social science like classical physical science, right? And right. saying, referring to that quantum physics, uh, saying that even in quantum physics, they are not doing that kind of sciences anymore. And belatedly in social sciences, far away from that, uh, exactness we they are trying to do so belated that is absurd way i think that was his critics yes uh you know that was 80 years ago and you mentioned that quantum physics was about 100 years old i remember from the very beginning of uh, morgenthau's book that he started that i mean that was based on his lecture about the liberalism and he was mentioning that the people's despair at the moment during the the second world war that uh, the, the philosophy they were holding was not providing a view over the world they were living in, but their despair was further intensified because they could not find an, any alternative uh, philosophy to that one that is rationalism or liberalism itself. 
Um, I feel a similar way uh, like he when I see, I mean, even 60 or 80 years later and listening to your presentation and reading your book, I am finding a hope whether mm -hmm. that quantum theory can provide an alternative way of, of, of philosophy in uh, beyond rationalism, beyond the liberalism, beyond individualism. What do you think about that possibility? Uh, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that's why I spent 10 years writing that book. I mean, I really firmly believe that if you internalize a quantum worldview, it really changes everything that you think. I mean, it's changed my views about what happens after death, actually. I mean, I sort of talk my way into believing that there's something after death because of the quantum perspective. Um, so, I, and, and in terms of individualism and liberalism, I think, um, that's part of the agenda and the paper that I presented today, although I didn't really present the, in retrospect, I didn't get to the good part. I didn't have time to get to the good part, but um, I do think it's a completely different way of thinking about social life. It's much more top down, it's much more whole, it's holistic and relational as a ver versus atomistic and individualistic. Um, and I think in the West, especially, we're very, very, it's very prone to kind of this bottom up individualistic liberal thinking. I'm not sure that's true globally. So there's this, the dominance of kind of these rational choice liberal assumptions may be very much a function of the dominance of the United States in the post-war context. Um, but I agree that it is, it's a very different ontology and it's an ontology that for me also gives me hope because it's a cooperative ontology. It's, a, it's an ontology that's saying, actually, we're not cooperating as much as we can. We can do more because our natural, con our natural tendency is to cooperate. And we're being held back by these old fashioned 19th century physical ideas. So it is really a, a, a very much about hope. Now, my critics will say hope or is it wishful thinking? You know, so they'll say it's wishful thinking, and I, I take the point. But you know, I'm a, you know we're academics, and we get to play around with ideas, and so this is my play. This is what I do for fun, anyway. So okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insightful lecture and the kindness to respond to all of those questions and your willingness to respond to them by even e emails. I would like to invite short, short uh, Jason. Emails. Short emails. <laughs> oh, short emails. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I remind you that you said short emails. Okay. <laughs> and I would invite uh, Jason uh, as a uh, organizer of these conferences and say something. Well, I just want to, uh, you know, join Professor Kim in, in thanking uh, Professor Wen's participation. This is the very uh, last event of this year of Korean Association of International oh, Studies. Yeah. And I think we close this year uh, very good with Professor Wentz's uh, insightful, enlightening. Probably we will invite him once again, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then learn from him more about how. Are you going to write a second book, uh, the Quantum Theory and International Relations? I think you mentioned that. I would like to. I mean, I'm writing a book about the UFO problem first because um, I have a something I want to say about that after the Pentagon basically vindicated my views on this um, earlier this year. Um, but eventually I do want to, you know, figure out how to, I think the pedagogy angle is probably the direction I would go, but it might have an IR component. Um, but I also want to write something on the world state, which I'm not, I still have one paper to write there. So I'm not sure yet. I'm going to just take it one step at a time. So. Okay. Uh, we'll look, we'll look forward to reading those you know, great works. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me on and, and thank you all for coming. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was a good question. All right. So. Thank you. Give thank me you. a big hand. Okay. All right. Okay.